Today on Let Me Be Frank, His Excellency is joined by a special guest who you might have heard of before. Dr. Scott Hahn, professor at Franciscan University and president of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and all around Catholic rock star, is here with us today to talk about the zeal of a convert and living a life of constant conversion. This is going to be a great conversation. So keep it right here at 1350 AM or keep listening on the Veritas app on your phone. If you don't yet have the app, you can download it at the Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, or VeritasCatholic.com. We're very grateful to Foundations in Faith for sponsoring Let Me Be Frank. From broken boilers to clog gutters, the St. Francis Xavier Fund for Missionary Parishes is there to partner with urban churches facing critical needs, building on their strengths by increasing capacity and fostering kinship between fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. During this season of giving, please consider making a donation to the SFX Fund to support this essential work. Visit foundationsinfaith.org to donate and help our pastors focus on saving souls rather than plugging holes. Foundations in Faith embraces innovative approaches to funding pastoral care programs in the Diocese of Bridgeport. From seminarians to retired priests, from baptism to last rites, from suburbs to inner cities, the reach is broad and the impact is meaningful. All right, here we go. This is Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. I am Steve Lee, and it is my pleasure, as always, to introduce Bishop Frank Caggiano. Steve, good good morning to you, my friend. It's always good to be with you. And as you said, today we have an extraordinary opportunity to, um, to, for at least for me, Dr. Hahn, to to have this conversation with you. And um, because you are among the few in our country and beyond who has had an enormous impact in the life of our church. Let me just give uh, Dr. Hanna a proper introduction. Um, yes. That was that was my Catholic rock star is from me. <laughs> oh. but, <laughs> Dr. Hahn is the Father Mike and Michael Scanlon Professor of Biblical Theology and the New Evangelization at the Franciscan University of Steubenville. He's the founder and president of the St. Paul Center, an apostolate dedicated to teaching Catholics to read scripture from the heart of the church. And Dr. Hahn has been married to his wife, Kimberly, for 42 years. They have six kids and 21 grandkids. And one of their sons, Father Jeremiah Hahn, is ordained to the Diocese of Steubenville. As the auditor and editor of over 40 popular and academic books, Dr. Hahn's works include best-selling titles like Rome Sweet Home, The Lamb's Supper, and Hail Holy Queen. And his most recent releases are titled Hope to Die, The Christian Meaning of Death and Resurrection of the Body, and It Is Right and Just, Why the Future of Civilization Depends on True Religion. They're both available at stpaulcenter.com. Dr. Hahn, what an exciting treat to have you join us this week. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Bishop Frank. It is truly an honor for me to join you. I'm telling you, Scott, as I said before, um, there are very few people who have had such an impact on the life of the church as yourself. And for me, it's a tremendous privilege to share this hour with you and to learn from you. I mean, it's it's a, just the amount that you have produced, all of quality is astounding, right? It, it's, a, it's the work of the Holy Spirit through you, without a doubt, without a doubt. So um, we have much to talk about. And if, if I may, just ask you to share with me and the audience your own personal journey of faith, journey to, to into the church and since. Please. Thank you, Your Excellency. Sure. I, I've written it up in a book that I co-authored with my bride, Kimberly, and it's called Rome Sweet Home or Journey to Catholicism. But let me give you a kind of Reader's Digest version of that, because, you know, it goes back to my upbringing in Pittsburgh as a sort of oh, uh, mainline Protestant in the Presbyterian denomination, but we were not regular church attenders at all. And so that left the back door open for me to get into a lot of uh, shall we say, delinquent misbehavior. And so after a couple of years of time spent in the juvenile uh, court system in Allegheny County, I I found Christ on a retreat one weekend, or he found me. And as a result of that, I I just applied my energy to the study of scripture. I had an excellent formator, uh, a fellow who was working in young life while studying mathematics at Pitt. Little did I know we'd end up studying in seminary. He would did a PhD from Harvard in theology, and uh, we've stayed in touch over the years, but he just gave to me this fire, 
of uh, passionate love for sacred scripture, and also Martin Luther and John Calvin. And so I wasn't approaching sacred scripture in terms of the tradition so much in terms of the Protestant Reformation. And so I wasn't just simply a non-Catholic. I was a vehement anti-Catholic. And so in high school, part of my whole lifestyle of evangelizing and sharing my faith was lovingly targeting my Catholic friends. I won't go into that. Perhaps later we can touch upon it. But uh, suffice to say that it wasn't bigotry or prejudice so much as it was a whole series of misunderstandings about what the Catholic Church really teaches and how well-founded or grounded in Scripture it is. But by the time I was finishing up high school back in the mid-70s, I was on my third round trip through the Bible. And so when I went off to college, I got to study theology and a second major in philosophy. But since my dad was paying tuition and wanted something more practical, I added a third major, economics. And so uh, in four years, I graduated. Got it. I also had the opportunity to study Greek so that I could read the New Testament in the original languages. But even more than that, I found my bride, the most beautiful gal on campus. And uh, together, we were working in Young Life, reaching out to the public high school kids. And so after we both graduated in 79, we got married that summer. And when we got back from our honeymoon, we packed up a U-Haul and we moved to Boston, where I had the privilege of studying at Gordon-Conwell Seminary, which sort of described itself as the Harvard of the evangelical schools. Very rigorous, demanding, but also faithful and orthodox. And three years, I graduated at the top of my class. But, you know, I got to study Hebrew. That was the main event for me to read the Old Testament in the original language and to study under some world-class scholars and professors. And after, you know, after graduation in 82, ordination came later that year. So I was the pastor at Trinity Presbyterian Church. But that last year in seminary, I began to connect the Old Testament and the New. And I, with the help of the early church fathers, I discovered what is now called typology or what Augustine described as how the new is concealed in the old and the old is revealed in the new. And that fulfillment wasn't simply back in the first century. It was a living relationship with Christ here and now. And so I I began to dive more deeply into the church fathers. And like John Henry Newman before me, it got me in a lot of trouble. Uh, I began to study myself into a crisis of faith. And I began to realize that a sermon-centered service is really a break from Christian tradition a Eucharistic service, the Holy Sacrament, the Blessed Sacrament, you know, and even though I didn't have the capacity to confect the Eucharist, I had enough intellectual honesty to realize that's the main event. And so as I adopted weekly communion as the, as the climax of the service, within less than two years, I had really backed myself into a corner. My congregation was excited, but they were becoming more aware of the fact that we're more than a little bit of a closet Catholic congregation. As an evangelical Calvinist Presbyterian congregation, we were almost schizophrenic or double-minded. And so I resigned respectfully, uh, but regretfully, and went in search of this church. And to make a long story short, the play, you know, to press fast forward, you know, I I, I spent the next two years doing in-depth research while I was working at the college where my wife and I had graduated, assistant to the president, and uh, also a a visiting professor of religion and philosophy. And then finally, in 85, I went to Marquette to do the doctoral program on a full ride. I'd gotten a full ride at Notre Dame and an offer at Marquette, but I'd found a group of four or five Jesuits who were really faithful and dynamic. And so I went to study under them, thinking that maybe in five years, I'd consider becoming a Catholic. And Less than one year, I made this wrong step. I ended up attending Mass for the first time in my life, just to see what, if anything, remains from what Justin Martyr lists in the second century in terms of this divine liturgy, thinking that there might be three or four residual elements. I was stunned to find 10, 12, practically the whole list. And I was sitting in the back pew in a basement chapel on a weekday, skipping lunch and attending Mass. And feeling like a journalistic observer, jotting notes. Suddenly, when I heard the words of consecration, the scales fell for me like they did for Paul, and I knew it was no longer bread. And by the time he consecrated the chalice, I was in the back pew literally drooling with this holy thirst for the precious blood of our Savior. And 
when the congregation began to chant all around me, Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, by the third chant, I realized where I was. I wasn't just in the back. I wasn't just in the back pew of a basement chapel. Uh, I was in the back of the New Testament. And so while all of these people went forward for Holy Communion, I was going back into the Apocalypse of St. John, which I had translated from the Greek. Uh, it took me an entire semester for a, a, a seminar. But I knew from my study that Jesus is called many things in that book, Alpha and Omega, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, but Lamb of God, Lamb of God, 28 times in 22 chapters, and nobody could ever explain to me why is that the principal title. And as I'm looking down on the page, I'm seeing the Amen, the Alleluia, the Holy, 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 you know, splashed across all of the pages of the Apocalypse. You don't find the phrase Second Coming once, certainly not the word rapture, but you find these liturgical words, phrases, furniture. And an hour after everybody was gone, I was sitting there back in the pew, stunned, looking down, looking up, trying to figure out, have I gone downstairs for a mass, or did I go up to the heavenly Jerusalem for the angelic liturgy that includes these saints and elders? And I spent the rest of the afternoon in the library. I signed out a bunch of books. I began to read the apocalypse that evening around 9 p.m. after we got our kids down. By the time I was finishing up around 3 a.m. with the help of the fathers, I realized that was the main event. That was the real deal. And so without telling my bride, I just started attending daily mass every day, skipping lunch for the next two weeks, finding myself experiencing a grace of conversion that transformed me. I knew I couldn't wait five years. And so I approached then Monsignor Bruskowitz, who became my spiritual father there at St. Bernard's. And I said, you know, look, can we meet? And after three or four meetings, I said, you know, do I have to go through RCIA? He laughed. He said, you're almost ready to teach the RCIA. <laughs> and he said, I could receive you, you know, into the church this Easter. And so to make a long story a little less long, you know, by the Easter vigil of 86, I was received into the church some 35 years ago. And looking back, I realized God's sense of timing, but also his sense of humor, because what happened five years after that was that Kimberly came into the church, actually four years later in 1990. And uh, it was an exciting, but also a very challenging time for our marriage, because we're both so intense, we're both so energetic and passionate. And, and so by 1990, we realized that God was calling us to share together our story. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. And 40 to 50 books later, here we are. It's a remarkable story. It's just a remarkable story. And, and, and thank you for sharing it. And it highlights um, the, the, the great gift that the fathers of the church are. Oh, yeah. Right? That many young adults are, re are rediscovering now, aren't they? That's They're right. beginning the access to. And it's in many ways, when I look back at my seminary formation, unlike what you described, we, I had very little exposure to the fathers of the church. Oh, Right, which was a tremendous loss. It was only when I went to Rome for my licentiate, which was four years after my ordination, which I was ordained the year after you entered into the church. I was ordained in 87. And then in 91, I went to Rome and I was in Rome for five years. And in the license program, a, a good amount of the study in all the different areas of theology was based on the fathers. And for me, it came as a revelation. It was like, an, it just it wasn't as profound perhaps as in your life, but it was just, I realized, first, I realized what I had not had. And secondly, the, it, it's like the echoing of music through the ages and how it becomes also. more profound, right? My curiosity, where did you go and what did you study? What was the subject of your licentiate to Sina? My licentiate was the image of Jesus um, um, at the right hand of the Father. Oh, wow. Right? Was the license. And then my doctoral uh, director had wanted me to, to take a totally different course and do the eschatology of St. Maximus the Confessor. And I took a glance at St. Maximus and I thought, oh my God, I'll be here 25 years. <laughs> I can't yeah. Why can't I do that? So we settled on St. Cyril of Alexandria and his notion of recreation. So it's, it's eschatology. Again, it was the fathers because I was so enamored. I am, I am such a bibliophile. 
Steve, I hope you're listening. Uh, later on, I'm going to ask you politely and respectfully to hit Bishop Frank up for copies of the Tassina as well as the doctoral dissertation. I've got a personal, I would be so interested, especially in Cyril of Alexandria, oh, but also yeah. in the idea of being enthroned at the right hand of the Father, because these are, these are gaps in our understanding, but not for the early church fathers. They really did see the sacred mysteries were more than just a series of doctrines. It was united in the most profound and powerful way. And to discover this, it's like, it just gets better over the years, you know? And, and the truth is, with Cyril of Alexandria, who was passionate, zealous, and by personality, not the easiest man to get along with, <laughs> right. it gave me great personal hope that I could get to... <laughs> right? St. Jerome does that for me, <laughs> his, his irascibility right. but, and all. Right. But I do want to mention something. You know, you mentioned your early years when you were... Um, um, zealous, zealous, right, for the faith. Um, talk to me about zeal, because I've always understood zeal to be a two-edged sword. It, it, has it has a tremendous place because it's the passion, but when it becomes unbridled, it could lead us into directions that perhaps are not always healthy spiritually. Do you have any thoughts on the gift of zeal and how, how to use it? Well, yeah, it's a great question. You know, I think back to my study in the Old Testament in Numbers 25, where Phineas, the avenging grandson of Aaron, is described as having zeal. And for that, he is rewarded with this perpetual covenant of everlasting peace. And, and you know, you, you have um, the line of Phineas and the Zadokites. And yet at the same time, as you mentioned, it's a double-edged sword. Um, you know, I'm reminded of Monsignor Ronald Knox, who spent literally years, decades, working on this massive project simply entitled Enthusiasm, of which he was rightly wary. Because, you know, enthusiasm is, is, a, is an expression of zeal. And even though it might be rooted etymologically in being in God, in theos, nevertheless, you know, it can be, you know, a liability as much as an asset. And I think it's it's accurate to summarize what what uh, Monsignor concludes at the end of hundreds of pages, and that is nothing was ever accomplished by enthusiasm, nothing valuable, nothing lasting. On the other hand, nothing valuable and lasting was ever accomplished without it. You know, so it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And if it is alone, it really is more of a liability than an asset because the human passions and the emotions are unruly and so to be tethered to the truth and the highest truths of all, that is not only right and just, but safe as well. And so I think I had role models in high school, in college and seminary who embodied that kind of balance between the profound and the passionate. And, you know, when you have that balance embodied uh, and, and you find yourself discipled or mentored, you begin to realize that, you know, the passions are easily and frequently misspent, but there's no better object for the passions than the profound depth and the beauty and the power of the sacred mysteries of faith. And so to combine that is almost like, you know, nitroglycerin, only it's constructive, not destructive. You know? Yeah, that's, that's a very well said. It, it, it is, um, that is why ultimately the life of faith has to be guided by wisdom. Right, as exactly, as not just simple knowledge. Is wisdom. Is yeah. Evil. I think to the image of Emmaus at the Synod on Youth, when the bishops discerned that, that that was the story, the biblical story, right, that would guide the framework for the for our report back to the Pope and the exhortation that the Pope actually spoke of. And the 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 phrase about our hearts were burning within us. In my mind, that conjures zeal, that passion that comes from the encounter. But just as you said, it happens within the context of breaking open the word and the breaking of the bread. So it's in the mystery of the, the liturgical life, the sacramental life of the church, but then the sufferings of life will temper the zeal as well. If you're willing to truly sacrifice, then the Holy Spirit will give you the parameter. That's because right. my great fear, Scott, in the church today, and me, if we have time, I'm gonna ask you, what worries you? There's one worry above all else, as you see the contemporary state of the church. 
And, and what would be the response to that? If I, I'm gonna anticipate a part of my answer to that same question, and that is people are not receptive to one another. There isn't a, a listening of the heart that has to happen. Okay. You know, taking a step back before I address that question, yeah, let please. me just build on what you were saying a moment ago about the bishops isolating Luke 24, the story of the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, because to me, that is like laser beam precision for our bishops to present that to the Holy Father, because that is the paradigm of ongoing conversion. Clopas and his companion weren't inquirers. They weren't neophytes. Presumably, they had been following Jesus for the last few years. Clopas's wife, Mary, and John 19, 25 is there at the foot of the cross. And so these aren't newcomers, and yet they can share with an apparent stranger how, you know, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. But listen, we had hoped, you know, they were, lo- they were losing that hope, and they were also looking sad. And the Greek word skothropoi is uh, more than sadness. It's, it's an embittered darkness that has settled upon their soul, and yet they were still probably self-classified or self-described as believers. And so, you know, when you think about that story, to me, it's almost like, a diamond with many facets, because you can hold up the Emmaus story and see, on the one hand, the need that followers of Jesus who are disciples, that is, they're disciplined students of the faith and followers of the master, and yet how they can lose hope and how they stand in need of the grace of conversion that isn't simply over and done a thing of the past. It is here and now, especially as we go through dark and difficult times. On the other hand, I think it also highlights something that is counterintuitive, to say the least, if not downright shocking, and that is, you know, our Lord's decision as to what to do on his first day back from the dead. I mean, there must have been lots of options, you know, in terms of dropping in on Pilate, Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, his mom, back, especially his mother. I'm sure he did that. But to opt instead to conduct a rather lengthy Bible study, beginning with Moses and the law and all of the prophets, with two apparent nobodies. I mean, we recognize that Clopas in Hegesippus is the brother of Joseph. So, you know, it's Uncle it's uncle Clopas. But, I mean, why not go to the, the apostles and spend all of that time with them? And the whole entire time, they don't recognize him. And I think Jesus was deliberately withholding his own identity until the main event, when he takes, he blesses, he breaks, and he gives, because that sequence is the exact same as the Eucharistic institution, two chapters earlier in Luke 22. But for Clopas and his friend, it's probably not a flashback. It isn't like a deja vu, because they weren't numbered among the 12. They probably weren't in the upper room. This is instead the moment of grace and the grace of a conversion, because when he disappears, he's not playing hide-and-go-seek or hard-to-get. He brought them precisely to the point of Eucharistic amazement, Eucharistic awakening. And so they turn to each other and they finally admit what they've been feeling for hours. Did not our hearts burn within us? As he opened the scriptures, they turn around, they walk back much more briskly, I'm sure, those seven miles, you know, and they report to Peter and the other 10 what had happened. And I can almost picture Peter trying to sort through, wait a minute, Clopas, that's your name, right? And you're telling us that the risen Savior just decided to spend his first day back from the dead with you, you know, like a lowly lay person. You know, we're the clergy, we're the hierarchy, we were here the whole time, you know, you know, you want us to believe that. And I could, I could sense the potential for tension, you know, because Clopas might have said, well, maybe if you hadn't denied him three times, you know, and Peter would have said, touche, (laughs) touche. And I think Peter would have said, well, it wouldn't take us hours to recognize him if he had appeared. But instead of a clash between these lowly witnesses and the hierarchy, it's simply the case that these lay witnesses tell the truth about their hearts were burning, their eyes were opened, and the apostles are to receive that testimony. And then suddenly, who should appear but the risen Savior to conduct the second lengthy scripture study on Easter Sunday evening? And it's like, Clearly, our Lord prioritizes the value and the importance of understanding Scripture in the light of his death and resurrection in order to understand his death and resurrection. 
And so like I, mean, I mean, it's just, it's inexhaustible. May I, there was just one insight I had at the Synod, and perhaps it's my own interpretation, but I, I just offer it because it had a profound effect on me. When, um, and I've preached on this, the, the story of Emmaus many times, or all clerics have, right? Right. And yet it was in the aula, and I've shared this in, in other podcasts, and it just dawned on me that if the simple proposition is that the mission was in Jerusalem, right? So this is where the believers were huddled, right? So they're walking away from it for whatever reason, just as you described so beautifully, right? Um, and the Lord walks with them in this parlance now, in the wrong direction with them. Right. So, so what struck me is if the Lord does that, why would his ministers not do that, right? To accompany people in their brokenness, in their, even in their despair, because if we're faithful, that moment of inbreaking will come and then they will turn around. Even when it means walking with them in the wrong direction. Exactly. But to me, it reminds me of what it was like to father six teenagers, you know, where you have to <laughs> accompany them, you have to love them unconditionally, you love them just as they are, but you love them too much to leave them that way. You know, you have exactly to them right. Around. But it's like, you know, slow motion every time with every kid. Wow. wow. So I hate to jump in, but we do need to take a quick break. This is Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano on the Veritas Catholic Network. His Excellency is speaking with Dr. Scott Hahn from Franciscan University and the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. This is a tremendous conversation. Uh, so stay right there. We will be right back. If you're concerned about your end-of-life plans, searching for a Catholic cemetery, or have loved ones who are buried in one of the 14 Catholic cemeteries throughout Fairfield County, now might be a good time to begin planning for yourself or for other family members. Call one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 to leave a message or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Many people don't realize that they can be buried with their deceased loved ones, even if all of the family's in-ground plots have been taken. The Diocese of Bridgeport Catholic Cemeteries provides in-ground burials, as well as columbarium and mausoleum options. This makes it possible to unite your family together in the same cemetery, and it's an opportunity to build a bridge for your family back to the church. Talking about this issue is not easy, but pre-need planning makes your wishes clear, reduces cost, and helps your family avoid difficult decisions at a time of grief and loss. You can start your planning now by contacting one of our family advisors at 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. We can guide you through the options, regulations, and considerations to help you make the best decisions for your family. The number is 203-742-1450 and select option 5 or visit www.ctcemeteries.org. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Uh, we are going to jump right back into this amazing conversation between His Excellency and Dr. Scott Hahn. Excellency? Yeah, Scott, I had uh, mentioned the question of uh, what what worries the average Catholic about the church? I mean, there are many concerns, many challenges, many worries. But for you personally, if there's a, a worry or a challenge that we're facing that rises to the top, what would that be? And what would your advice be to those listening, myself as a bishop, to how, how would we address the challenge? Well, building on the previous part of our conversation, I think the need for ongoing conversion is arguably the single greatest need, you know, but turn that coin around and you can see tails, you can see the underside of that. And that is when people don't recognize their own limitations, they only recognize other people's limitations. And I think then that you have this uh, occasion, it's almost unavoidable at that point, where, you know, you're basically out to set the other people straight. And I think, you know, in 42 years of marriage, I've discovered a thousand times that whenever I'm out to set her straight, you know, she she does not respond well. 
But when I set myself straight, when I open myself up to hear her heart and to say, okay, your fears, your concerns are valid. You know, let's come together and uh, unite, you know, because I know what I'm thinking and what I'm afraid of is not invalid, but likewise, you know. So we have a series of lines sort of like, you know, you know, I feel like I'm always right, you know, but in fact, I'm often wrong, you know, and the fact is we're always right when we come together. And so that is, in effect, a small grace of conversion because it's a call to humility. It's a call to accept your limitations. It's also to recognize that in this sacrament we call matrimony, Kimberly has become the principal instrument of God's grace to to sanctify me, to instruct me, not always as she wants, but as he wants, you know. And so uh, we're aware of this town in Europe where uh, whenever newlyweds, uh, whenever they exchange the vows, they do it with their hands upon a crucifix, because what they're doing in this sacrament is embracing the other, but they're also embracing the one who will become their cross. Now, I know Kimberly has been my cross. I also know that I have been her much greater and larger and heavier cross. But the, the fact is, I, I really believe the loss of the sense of the supernatural is what backs us into this corner where it gets darker and darker, but we don't even recognize it because, let's face it, we always tend to prefer to pluck the low-hanging fruit. And natural truths, natural experiences are low-hanging fruit. Unfortunately, they're often rotten fruit. And so, you know, to get involved in, there's nothing wrong with secularity. In fact, there's everything right about it. You know, as a supernumerary in Opus Dei, sanctifying the temporal order, embracing holy secularity is what it's all about, to become contemplatives on Main Street, saints in the middle of the world, etc. But secularity is not to be confused with secularization, where the tsunami of secularism just sweeps over and basically effaces or subverts that the supernatural. And, and so to me, the sacred mysteries of faith can easily become Catholic talking points. I mean, for us as professionals, for laity and clergy, and for cradle Catholics as well as converts. And so, you know, when, when Pope St. John Paul II called for not just cultivating Eucharistic faith, not just cultivating Eucharistic devotion, but cultivating what he called Eucharistic amazement in his last encyclical, Ecclesia de Eucharistia, the Church of the Eucharist. You know, earlier this year on May 21st, when our son Jeremiah was ordained to the priesthood by the Bishop of Steubenville, to see my son become my sacramental father, to kneel at the Predu with his, with his mother and get that first priestly blessing after the bishop had knelt before the new ordinand. And likewise, to... Uh, to have him hear my confession after he heard his mother's confession and to hear his wise counsel and to perform the penance. I mean, this stuff is so much more than just true. It's real, it's powerful, it's beautiful, but it's covered with dust. And it can be easily routinized because when you lose the sense of the supernatural, you don't lose the sense that these things are true, but you end up sort of like, hmm, I think majoring on the minors. And that is, allowing the natural truths and experiences of the economy, politics, geopolitics, and, you know, the, the, the crises in the world, the country, the church, they just blind us and they divide us and they politicize and polarize us. And we forget the one thing that if God is a father from all eternity, however old creation is, it's not eternal. So the idea, the principal identity of God is not our creator, but the eternal father, he's eternally fathering. And so through the son, by the spirit, we're a family, not a nation, you know, not a political party, you know, not a human organization. And so when you see a family that is polarized and divided politically, you see what is rightly described as a dysfunctional family. And to me, you know, if we're not out to transform the culture according to the faith, the culture will definitely deform us. And so to me, the need for the new evangelization is precisely for the grace of ongoing conversion to be the lived experience of all of us. And it counteracts the, the devangelization, which has been going on now for decades, you know, not just 40 or 50 years, but more like 70, 80, 90, or 100 and more. And so this is to me how to translate the Great Commission into an action plan that will unite clergy and laity 
by helping us recognize that just like Clopas, so like Simon Peter, we've got to come together and admit the fact that we've gone through a period of darkness. We need the light of the Paschal mystery. Jesus' death and resurrection aren't just true. They're the sine qua non. Without rediscovering the Paschal mystery, we're toast. Our parish, our diocese, our city, state, country. On the other hand, I have to believe that the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings wants to heal and empower and transform us more than we want him to. And he's got a capacity to do it. But if we humble ourselves, he will exalt us. But if we exalt ourselves over and against other people, he will certainly humble us for our sake and for others as well. And so in a nutshell, that's sort of how I see it. Yeah, I, I think it's extraordinarily well said. Uh, I, see, my, my sense is for those of us who were born into the Catholic Church um, and did not have to have that journey of reflection and conversion into the church at a later age, the great temptation is to take it all for granted. You just kind of like go for the ride. And you've met many people, and, and myself included. Uh, yeah, it, myself as, as well. Yeah, yeah, right? So, so I think part of it is, just as you said, is to help people to understand that conversion is, in my kind of simple way of looking at it, is an ever-deepening love of the person who should be really at the center of your life. The right. person. Right. And just as you love your wife and I loved my parents and I, we friends share love, you, you really can't get enough of it. Right. It always continues to grow. And there's more questions to ask and you want to spend time with the person. And in some way, shape or form in the old, I call the old days when I was a little child, when I was a young boy, there was a Catholic culture in our neighborhoods that kind of carried some who were not necessarily seeking conversion of life, but it was the outer structures that kind of kept them moving in the right direction. But as you say, all of that has been dismantled. That's and right. In many, right? And in many ways- Literally and systematically and effectively. Exactly. So, so I'm curious about this question, if I may. Part of what's been animating my thinking, and, and perhaps it's wrong thinking, but I, history goes in one direction for a reason, obviously. So to pine for an age and the, whatever the good old days, though that's all gone, right? We're not reconstructing that. But I do think we have to give thought to reestablishing a healthy, vibrant Catholic culture that would foster the ongoing conversion that you speak of. And I wondered to myself how we can do that without isolating ourselves by still keeping one foot in the world, as you say, because that's our missionary mandate is to go out and be living witnesses to the larger world, like St. Paul did. And in, in some ways, I fancy myself when the apostles were in the upper room and presumably after they went in mission, when they gathered periodically together, that was a, an exercise of culture. It was an exercise of remembrance. It was an exercise of mutual support, a, a reinforcing of values that are always going to be tempted when you go out, right, to the world. So I guess my question is this. Am I on track? This idea of, of discerning as a church now how we can move towards creating a culture that supports ourselves and, and our, our fellow believers in a way that nurtures this ongoing conversion so that we could go out into the world and not get lost in the world. Right, right. Does that make sense at all? It, it, not only does it make sense, not only are you on track, you know, I was distracted about a moment ago by thinking, I've got to get Bishop Caggiano to one of our summer conferences so a thousand, fifteen hundred people can hear this. Yes, I mean, again, talk about laser precision. I think that this is on track. I was also reminded a few minutes ago of what, I mean, to paraphrase St. Jose Maria Escriva, we're not simply out to reach them. We are them and we need to be reached. And I, I, I think of that, you know, I mentioned during the break, um, right before we came back, uh, that I often feel like the donkey that Jesus chose to ride into Jerusalem, you know, and I, I think sometimes the donkey was fooled into thinking they were uh, cheering for him, you know but it was really just what he was bearing to them. And to have the privilege of bearing Christ to others, you know, is only surpassed by Christ coming to us. 
And I think it's easy to professionalize my work as a theologian, as a teacher, as an author, as a speaker. And again, it happens gradually. It's imperceptible. But it's true at every level. Laity, clergy, you know, cradle Catholic, convert. We need this grace of conversion. I mean, I know how to teach in a way that's excited uh, about apostolic succession, about the words of consecration, about transubstantiation, about the real presence of Christ, body, blood, soul, and divinity. But it can come off like Polly want a cracker. You know, uh, you, you, you have a parrot, you know. And so when you look at all of the things that we profess and you recognize they're true, it, you know, it's amazing how unamazed we are at, I mean, we sang Amazing Grace long before I became a Catholic, but I want to take it to a new level because, you know, it's almost too good to be true, except and unless, of course, it is. And it's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. But these truths are so lofty. I mean, they're almost inaccessible apart from supernatural grace. And that grace needs to be renewed every morning. Just a few hours ago, I wake up and I'm quite naturally alive, but supernaturally quite asleep. And so a morning offering, reading the Gospels, the rosary as well. These are like spiritual breakfast without which I, I really can't make it through the first part of the day. And I think those daily disciplines, I mean, it, it's nice to have the novelty of the grace of ongoing conversion. So it's exciting again and again. It's also important to have the routine and the discipline. I mean, that's how marriage works. That's how your job works. You don't just show up when you're excited about your job. You know, and so again, to combine the discipline with the zeal to me is to always open ourselves up to the need of an annual retreat, absolutely necessary, and not just for clergy, but likewise, you know, a, a workshop so that these materials are repristinated, they're rejuvenated. And, you know, you might say, well, you've been at it now for 35 years. That's why I need it more than others. That's why I need it now more than 30 years ago. And so I, I'm, you know, I, I say to God, people want so much of me. And he says, Scott, they really want me. So just make sure that you're filled with me. Otherwise, you really will think it's you they want when it's right. not. It's me. Right. Right. And, and, right. and the other thing, too, is I feel as though the more we get involved as Catholics in the church and in the world, the more I tend to forget, Lord, you know, I, I want you to use me to sanctify them you know, my students, the congregation or whatever. And he always kind of winks, smiles and says, I want to do that, but I want to make you holy more than I want to use you to make others holy because you're a child more than you're an employee. You're a son of mine more than you're my slave. And I mean, those micro adjustments become necessary, not just every year, not just every day, but almost every hour or at least every other hour. And again, this is, you know, this is Catholicism 101, but it's not enough just to read it and to lecture it. You really have to open yourself up to become like a child again and again, so that the older we grow, the smaller we are in the arms of Our Lady and in the, in the presence of God the Father. That redeployment of childlikeness, not childishness, but really becoming childlike especially for theologians, you know, we handle these sacred mysteries and we debate all kinds of theological opinions. And it's so easily, again, we back ourselves into political and partisan camps. And it's like, God, the father's like, seriously, what will it take to get through to these fraternal rivals that they're meant to fall in love, you know? Right. Right. You know, my spiritual director at the seminary um, had early in direction, because I guess he sensed this was a, a profound need of mine. Um, <laughs> he said to me, and we've talked about this in other uh, uh, broadcasts, that for good people who will be working on their weaknesses and fighting against their sinfulness, oftentimes leave their strengths unguarded. And if there's a weak link in your chain, it may be your strength, not your limitation, weakness, or sin that the father of evil will use. And I think we know a whole history of leaders in faith that have fallen flat on their face because they left their strengths unguarded and they began to believe what you said, Scott, that it's me, but it's not you. You count less than zero. So let's get that all through all of our heads. Right. In the end, it's the Lord Jesus, first and foremost. And we are the vehicles of that 
message, grace, and presence. And then we have infinite value because we are the beloved of the Father through the Son. So just to be, and I've always gone back to that. I've, and I struggle with that sometimes because it's very hard to be that donkey. It is hard to be that donkey. It is. You know, what you just said, Your Excellency, reminds me of something that I was told by one of my best friends who happens to be my father-in-law and one of the godliest evangelical leaders I've ever known. He's 90, but he's still practicing his faith and also doing ministry. He said to me when we got married, he found out, oh, he said, oh, Scott, you are so gifted. But he said, your gifts, they could kill you, especially if you forget their gifts and you've got to continually give them back to the giver in Amen. order for them to be his. You know, I'm like, well said, I'll owe you eternally, dad. You know? Exactly. I, that was some of the best advice I've ever received in my life. And now that I'm a diocesan bishop, many times I counsel priests who struggle precisely because they forget that all they have is a gift at service of the giver. Right. And our contribution is, is extremely important, but it's not eternal without him, right? Indeed. You know, just to step back to something you mentioned a few minutes ago, and that is the need to restore a Catholic culture or culture, at least yes. restore a Catholic family subculture, you know, and not just for individual households, but for neighborhoods and parishes especially to recognize that just as the household is you know, the domestic church, the ecclesia domestica, so likewise, the parish is an extended family. It's a family of families. And I think that that also needs to be rediscovered in order for us to create pockets of flourishing Catholic family life and subculture. You know, it's not just homeschooling families, though, in the Steubenville area, you know, we have a lot of that, but we also have public school. We have Catholic mm -hmm. Central, where my youngest son is teaching Latin and philosophy. And there's a marvelous collaboration. It could be a whole lot more marvelous, but, you know, looking for places or creating opportunities for that kind of flourishing family life. Uh, there are always going to be seismic fault lines and personality differences and that sort of thing. But get over yourself and then you'll get over the other, you know, and. Uh, right. Not, I just, share one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, please. No, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I was just thinking of, of how, you know, the, these two sides of our conversation really fit, because if we recognize our limitations and the fact that these strengths of ours are pure gifts, you know, then we can see that the personalities that rub us the wrong way in the parish or even in our own families, you know, are there just like, you know, the hammer and the chisel in the hand of the divine sculptor. We need to be chipped away, you know, and... Right. Uh, uh, we're going to have tensions, we're going to have conflicts, but, you know, when you look at Good Friday and then Easter Sunday, you realize that out of the darkness, out of the difficulty comes the best grace. Amen. Amen. Uh, just for the time we have left, I do want to, to, to give you some time to comment on what is your passion, really, which is sacred scripture. And more specifically, you keep reminding us that we need to read sacred scripture in the heart of the church. So what does that mean for our well, listeners? Yeah, stepping back and just looking at the Emmaus Road, because that is our template. It wasn't the case that Clopas and his companion were biblical ignoramuses. If they had been following our Lord, like Simon Peter and the others, they've been hearing a lot of this, you know. But at no point do they say, doesn't this voice sound familiar? You know, who else used to make the connections like this? Could this be Jesus? No, they really had to be awakened in a, in a profound way. And to me, the grace of ongoing conversion is sort of the drive shaft of what we've been doing for 20 years. Uh, 20 years ago, we founded the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Just two weeks ago, we celebrated our 20th anniversary with or down in Orlando with over almost 400 people. Um, biblical literacy for lay people, biblical fluency for clergy and for teachers, but together reading scripture from the heart of the church, reading it in liturgical terms. You know, one of the greatest discoveries I made along the path to becoming Catholic was I wanted to be a New Testament Christian until I studied the New Testament and realized that in the Greek, the only time Jesus ever uses the phrase, the New Testament, kind idea thekes in Luke 22, 20, when he says, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the New Testament, the new covenant poured out for you and for many. He doesn't say, write this in remembrance. He says, do this. 
So to realize that the New Testament was a sacrament before it started to become a document, according to the document, doesn't devalue the document, but it subordinates the word inspirated to the word incarnated who is there for us in the Holy Eucharist, in Holy Communion. And so it's the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology because we don't necessarily need more and more Bible studies. We also don't just need more and more theology. It's the combination of the two. You know, so for Aquinas, my hero, you know, Sacra Pagina, the sacred page, and Sacra Doctrina, sacred doctrine, go together. And so if we have the solid teaching of the church magisterium, that doesn't in any way exempt us from diving into scripture. That empowers us and enables us to get more out of it. So it's not just knowing the Bible, it's knowing scripture in terms of the doctrine, but not just doctrine, but the paschal mystery. All of the sacred mysteries pop off the page in like a three-dimensional movie where you have the right spectacles on and you're like startled to see more and more of these connections between the old and the new, between scripture and the Eucharist, between the sacraments and everyday life. It's all about making connections for beginner, intermediate, and advanced. Saintpaulcenter.com is where they can go. Emmaus Road is the publishing house that I founded 25 years ago with my former students who were still in town. Curtis Martin, Ted Sri, Tim Gray, all these guys who had lived with my family for a few years. And so Emmaus Road Publishing is doing all of these book projects. Again, we have Emmaus Academic for the professors and for the seminarians. We also have Emmaus Road for the lay people. We have material for inquirers, for the more advanced, the highly motivated. And we have over 40 full-time co-workers. And together, I think we have this sense that are we allowed to have this much fun on this side of eternity? You know, because it, it's almost too much fun. It really is to, to light a fire, you know, and to re-enkindle that imagination so that people will say, our hearts were burning within us so that our eyes are open in the breaking of the bread. Well, that was an interesting, well, actually two observations, if I may. The first is with this project now beginning with the Institute on the Catechism that the oh, USCCB wow. is fostering. The fact that the word of God has been woefully not present in most catechesis and evangelization in the church. Right, so what you're speaking of is exactly the antidote, right? And we have this most scripturally saturated catechism in the history of the Catholic Church. And right. even because it's called a catechism, you know, people diminish its value. No, I would say if I had written that book overnight, I would have become a world-renowned theologian. That, <laughs> you know, it's not perfect, it's not inerrant, it's not inspired, but man alive, is this thing still a slumbering giant? We really right. got to recognize what a gift that catechism is for the next century or two. Absolutely. And the other thing, if I may, you use the word imagination. Yes. What does imagination have to do with reading the scripture in the heart of the church? Well, when we read scripture, we discover this story, this narrative called salvation history. And what we've got to recognize is that unlike all of these other books, nonfiction or fiction, this is our story. This is what God is doing as our father, fathering a family by sending his son to make us his sons and daughters, brothers and sisters. Again, it's almost too good to be true, but it's the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the gospel truth for Catholics. And so to, to, to not know who I am or why I'm here is to basically forget that in my imagination, I've got to see that I'm not just a character in a story. I'm a son or I'm a daughter. I'm a brother or a sister. You know, I'm a husband or a wife, and we have parts to play that are more than just scripted, you know, in Hollywood. You know, when we speak of scripture, we've got to see that this is meant to awaken an imagination so that we can look out and say, again, it's almost too good to be true. Are we allowed to have this much fun? And this is going to renew the joy that will not only survive through suffering. This is the kind of joy that will actually flourish more through suffering than simple comfort and prosperity. It's the joy that's the foretaste of heaven. Exactly. In the end. You know, I, when I visited the Holy Land for the first time, it changed my entire way of praying over the scriptures, particularly the gospels. Do, would, would you agree? Would you, is, totally. is that on the bucket list of every believer, please God, if that ever could happen? Totally. 
I've been there a, a dozen times, and I tell you, it's the fifth gospel, as St. Jerome did, described uh -huh. it. And it really does connect what we read with what we can imagine, so that the imagination is not just something that we, you know, try to conjure up on our own. It's something that is there now as it was 2,000 years ago. And it just, it really gives us an anchor so that this is not just a story that could float away. This is the reality. You know, the word of God ought to be how we define reality, truth for ourselves and others. May I'm just going to share one quick story. And that is um, the first time I came, I went to the Holy Land. <clears throat> I was with a priest, a group of priests from Brooklyn. And of course, we went on the Via Cruces. And what struck me was many of those streets probably are unaltered from the time of the Lord when the Lord himself walked it. And as I walked the, the path, how people were busy about their own business, never made notice of us because we were one of God knows how many tourist pilgrims walked that road. And then it struck me that the Lord and Savior of all carried the cross and no one, chances are, even took notice of it. And it just, it gave a sense of the depth and breadth of the abandonment that the Lord gave away, right? For a people mostly who would not have even given the, 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 the modicum of noticing that somebody was there. Right. And perhaps he was one of many. And it just struck me the profound love that God has for us to have endured all of that for me, for you. And to build on that, you know, to recognize that he was redeeming the world while the world was cursing him, turning their backs on him. But what was true then and there is just as true here and now when we carry our crosses and go unnoticed, but not uncriticized, you know. Uh, there really is a sense in which we become sharers in this work, co-redeemers, if you will, as Paul describes us as God's co-workers in Corinthians 3.9. But I mean, that also invests, you know, the little things with whole lots of meaning. Love, you know, love in the little things is the greatest love of all. And, you know, what you just described, Your Excellency, is almost verbatim. What Kimberly leaned over and whispered to me on the Via Della Rosa when we were going through these busy streets, I think it was the third or fourth station, she says, you know, this is so much like it probably was back then when people are just passing by too busy with their lives to notice that their lives are being redeemed right now, right under their noses, you know, and oh, exactly. it, just, it, it never ceases to amaze me, you know, how so much of the divine and the extraordinary is lived out in the humdrum, the human and the ordinary. Scott, this has been a tremendous conversation. Thank you. Thank oh, you for taking the time to be on the podcast. Thanks to you. You're welcome. But what a joy. What an honor it really has been for me as well. We're going to get you back here <laughs> when the conference is Lord willing. Be careful what you ask for. You may regret that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Steve has a son who studies here. And so that's doubly, you know. Yeah, so Steve has we to have come to along as well. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. You're so welcome. Let's take one more break and we'll be right back with Let Me Be Frank on the Veritas Catholic Network. Welcome back to Let Me Be Frank with Bishop Frank Caggiano. Excellency, we've come to the part of the show where you answer a listener question. Mm -hmm. And so we got an email with two questions and I, I couldn't help but smile when I read the second one. So I'll just read it. Here it is. Bishop Frank, a friend told me that priests are not allowed to change any words during the mass, but I know a wonderful priest who does change the word sometimes. Is my friend correct or is it okay? Also, my kids sometimes play mass at home. Is this okay? Well, the answer number two is absolutely, because when I was a young boy, I did as well. And I think part of my vocation was rooted in that. So I think there is nothing wrong with that. But as for the first, there's a, a distinction. Um, in certain parts of the, of the mass, it says, use these or similar words. So there are places where a priest could use his own expression. But where that is absent, then remember, the liturgy is not a personal possession. It's the prayer of the church. And I'm going to quote Bishop Daly of happy memory, right? He said, you do the red and say the black in the sacramentary. And I would say for the priest, whoever that priest may be, if he is improvising or using words where it's not appropriate, then he should do what the, what the church has as its ritual. 
because it's the sacrament of our unity, not of our differentiation, if that makes sense. Great. And maybe one day uh, this uh, listener's kid will be a bishop like you. Could you imagine? And then I could retire. What a great <laughs> idea. <laughs> uh, all right. So if, if you have a question for Bishop Frank, send it in to us on social media, or you can email questions at veritascatholic.com. Bishop Frank Caggiano is on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So is Veritas Catholic Network. We would like to thank Foundations in Faith. A grant from the St. Therese Fund for Evangelization makes it possible for us to bring Let Me Be Frank to you. Foundations in Faith is committed to supporting and transforming pastoral ministries in the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you can learn more about their outstanding work at foundationsinfaith.org. Dr. Scott Hahn, thank you so much for your decades of amazing work. Thank you for being a part of Let Me Be Frank today. You know, I was thinking, uh, if you don't have your own uh, show uh, and you want one, you could call it Han Solo. So, <laughs> oh, sorry, I, I, I can't yes. help it. Ever since I became a dad, these puns just keep coming. Oh up. my god! Well, I do have one. Road to Emmaus. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Okay. Of, of course you do. Of course, absolutely. So, Scott, our thank list- you. Thank yes. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Now, so anyway, my friends, yes, I our, our, our listen. Our listeners should go to stpaulcenter.com. They should look up the Road to Emmaus podcast. That's right. We also have something called Letters from Home, where we share daily reflections on the scripture readings for the Mass each day. And Uh that is really turning out to be popular and fruitful, too. So Uh Emmaus Uh Road Publishing does most of all of my resources now. Tremendous. 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 Excellency, before we all go, would you please give us your blessing? Yes. And we're on the eve of Thanksgiving then, right? So we're going to certainly, as we always do as Christians, we're a thankful people. We'll lift our minds and hearts to the Lord in thanksgiving for our conversation and for all the blessings the Lord so graciously gives us. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for showering us with your love, with the countless blessings and graces in ordinary and extraordinary ways that you give us as your children, most especially for the gift of your Son, who is our Savior and Redeemer. So may your Holy Spirit continue to bless Dr. Hahn and all his colleagues, that the good work that they do in helping your people to grow in conversion and love of you and the mission of, that you have given them, to strengthen our church may continue to bear great spiritual fruit. And bless us as we celebrate this Thanksgiving, that it may be a time of refreshment, grace, and peace. We ask this as we ask all things in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Have a blessed Thanksgiving, Scott. To you, to your family. See, same to you. Thanks, Excellency. Thank you, Dr. Hahn.